Within a century, Christians built churches and monasteries. This is St. Paul's in Jaro, parts of which date from the 7th century. Faith and stone weren't the only things the Christian missionaries brought to the country. They brought the international language of the Christian religion, Latin. Latin terms became part of the English word hoard. Altare became altar. Apostolus became apostle. Mass, monk and verse and many others all come from the Latin. This would become a pattern of English, the layering of words taken from different source languages. And from Latin too, the English took their script. The Angles, Saxons, Frisians and Jutes who had become the English hadn't brought script as we know it with them, but runes. The runic alphabet was made up of symbols formed mainly of straight lines so that the letters could be carved into stone or wood. Those were their media rather than parchment or paper. Though this is a short poem, most examples of runic writing that survive suggest runes were mainly used for short, practical messages or graffiti. The Latin alphabet was different. With its curves and bows, it allowed words to be easily written using pen and ink onto pages of parchment or vellum, which, gathered together into a book, could be widely circulated. Christianity brought the book to these shores. Verbum, the word. Soon a native culture of scholarship began to flower, a culture based on Latin and on writing. The magnificent Lindisfarne Gospels were created in the 8th century on the island of Lindisfarne, just off the northeast coast. A few miles south, at the monastery of St. Paul's in Jaro, the great English monk and scholar Bede, born and educated in Northumbria, began writing the first ever history of the English-speaking people. He wrote, of course, in Latin, the language of scholarship. The prevailing language among the people was still Old English, but Latin, this powerful medium, was now amongst them. Now, Old English was written down, using the Latin alphabet, while retaining some of the old runes as letters. From the 7th century, we find English itself written on parchment in a language and a script which we can just about recognise as our own. Father Usher Dwarthin Hiofnu, Siga Halgard Noma Thin, Tukumath Richa Thin, Si Willow Thin Swais in Hiofne and in Eortho. Hlaf Usirne of Wislich Selos today, and for Gifus Schulde Usra, so we for Gifon Schuldgem Usum. And the inlaid Usi in Kostum. With writing, Old English stole a march on other languages spoken in Europe at the time. Prayers were recorded and books of the Bible translated. The laws of the land were written down, and the language soon became capable of recording and expressing an increasingly wide and subtle range of human experience. And in the right hands, Old English was now powerful and supple enough to take you to imaginary worlds, fire the blood, be poetry. What we gardener in Yardawum, Theod Kuninger, Thrumgefrunon. So, the spear days and days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. No one knows who composed the epic Beowulf sometime between the mid-7th and end of the 10th century. It's the first great poem in the English language, 
the beginning of a glorious tradition which will lead to Chaucer, Shakespeare and beyond. The poem celebrates the glory days of the Germanic tribes, epitomised in the heroic warrior who gives the poem its name. The power of the language can be heard in this passage, which introduces Beowulf's archenemy, the monster Grendel. The comb of Mora, under Misleothem, Grendel Gongan. Goders In off the moors, down through the mist bands, God cursed Grendel came greedily loping. Muntisse Manskaffe. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for a prey in the high hall. Come tha to Rekeda, rink spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bawn. On bread the Biala Hudig, the Higa Borgan was. Then his rage boiled over, he ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench bit into his bone lappings, bolted down his blood and gorged on him in lumps, leaving the body utterly lifeless, eaten up hand and foot. What does that tell us about English at that time, Seamus? What sort of language was it when you came to it? Do you think this is a fully developed poetic language? It's certainly a fully developed poetic language. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's capable of great elaboration. But what... Uh, struck me generally about Old English from the moment I read the bits of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle right through to Beowulf is it's terrific for telling what happened. It's a, a wonderful sense of the indicative mood all through it. It's terrific for action, terrific for description. There's a wonderful forthright capacity to make up extra language in Anglo-Saxon. The words are, are very clear and direct, bone and house, for example. Bone house, there you have the house for the body, a word for the body. Beautiful words for instruments. Uh, the harp is called uh, gleo beam, the glee beam, the happy, the happy wood, or else uh, the joy wood, uh, I think so, goman wudu. Swords uh, or shields. The shield is the war board, weak board. That is a specific poetic energy that's in the language. Uh, the, the the ability to make compounds, which is still in German, I guess, that gives it a great beauty. How extensive is the vocabulary? I think there are forty thousand uh, words recorded in in Beowulf, but a lot of the words repeat themselves in a. a Probably this is in poetry more than in the prose. If we heard an Anglo-Saxon speaker speaking uh, under his roof to his companion, we'd probably hear a very a quicker, a different, less elaborate language from Beowulf. Would you say it, was, it is very clearly written to be read aloud? It's certainly written to be read aloud. The question that, that agitates some scholars is whether it was written, you know. But I think the general... Uh, consensus now is that by the time you get to Beowulf, you have a, a writer um, dealing with a traditional oral language. What? We gardener in Yardawum, Theod Kuninger, Thrungefrunon, Hutha Athelingus, Ellen Fremedon. Certainly you, you open the book, What We Gardena and Yardagum, it asks to be uttered, and there are many speeches in it. And it comes off the tongue with, with terrific directness, I think. Latin and Greek had created great bodies of literature in the classical past. In the East, Arabic and Chinese were being used in the 8th and 9th century as languages of poetry. But at that time, no other language in the Christian world could match the achievement of the Beowulf poet and his anonymous contemporaries. Old English was flourishing. The adventure was underway. But while the seeds of English had come from these Frisian shores in the 5th century, so now, in the late 8th century, a potential destroyer was preparing his battle fleet 500 miles or so to the north. 